Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, specializing in authors and musicians. We shine only when we make you shine. Call us today at 941-567-6193. David Spiro began his career in music at the tender age of 13 as the cue card holder on his father's rock and roll music show, Upbeat in Cleveland, Ohio. He went on to become one of the pioneering DJs of the new FM format in radio, a free forum limited only by the DJ's imagination. Remember those days, wish they were back. He left radio in 1973 to become the manager for Michael Stanley. He went on to become manager for Joe Walsh. Yusuf Islam, better known to the uh, old guys as Cat Stevens, uh, Dickie Betts, Jesse Colin Young, Kenny Loggins, Richie Fure, Simon Kirk, and Paul Rogers of Bad Company, and many others. A uh, friend to Jackson Brown, our buddy Mark Farner, Al Cooper, Harry Nielsen, and so many more. He has traveled the globe with his bands, listening, watching, and helping from the wings. Please welcome high profile music manager, author, and president at DSM Inc., David Sparrow, to interviewing the legends. Hello, David. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I admire you a lot. I mean, uh, management is not easy. I've I've owned companies and managed a bunch of people, but managing musicians has got to be something else. And next a level. A lot of babysitting. A lot of babysitting. <laughs> you know, Ray, it's... Uh... <laughs> Fortunately, it pays better than babysitting, but you know, that's, that's the number one role, you know, and you got to do what you love, which I do. I mean, I've doing this now for over 10 years. I started out as a DJ back in the let's late seventies. I was a top 40 guy. And what I'm doing now, I've thousands of interviews. I haven't got paid one nickel. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to showbiz. <laughs> Welcome to showbiz, right? <laughs> <laughs> your book is incredible i loved it oh thank you thank you very um, much i'm so really proud of it fantastic stories um i want to get r- right off the bat um i want to say a life in the wings my 60-year love affair of with rock and roll it's a memoir david sparrow with adrian is it zonneville is that zonneville adrian? yep zonneville um first off i want to mention the cleveland uh indians who are now of course um a different name as well uh the, the guardians. guardians yep yep <laughs> they won today though so that's they won good. today huh that's good <laughs> news yeah your son was a um bat boy is that right yeah one of my proudest moments <laughs> what year was that uh he was with the indians from 94 to 97 i think Okay. They went to the World Series twice. He's got, uh, you know, two rings from being the American League championship team. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also was one of the uh, the all-star bad boys in, uh, I think it was 96 or 97. Right. I'm an and, Oriole and fan. And I got to hang. I mean, that was the coolest <laughs> thing in the world for me to, like, go down to the locker room with, you know, Kenny Lofton and Albert yep. Bell and all those guys. I mean, this is when the Indians were hot. Right. And um, it was so much fun. And, and you know, I, uh, you don't get to live vicariously through your kids that often, but I got to. Yeah, I saw you in uniform. Um, I did a fantasy camp with the Orioles. And ah. I'm an Oriole fan. Of course, the Indians beat the Orioles in those playoffs. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but th- there's a story here. A lot of people don't know. They don't realize that where the Guardians, the name the Guardians came from. I I know, but can you explain it to to everybody? I wish I knew. (laughs) You don't know. (laughs) No, I mean, I knew that Dolan's son was running for Senate. and They were worried that the Wahoo thing would be uh, a problem. So they made the change before he announced his candidacy. And then he lost the, uh, you know, the uh, primary and took a lot of crap because of changing the name from the Indians. I know. <laughs> kind of backfired on him, you know. Well, I was also a Redskins fan, so I'm with you, man. I yeah, guess. yeah. It's, it's I, tough to it's, lose that, isn't it? 
<laughs> yeah, but w I don't know anything. I don't know why it's the Guardians. Okay, well, the new name was inspired by the Guardians of Traffic s statues located on oh, the right, right. Memorial Bridge. Okay, yep. Yep. it was originally right called the, the Lorraine the Carnegie Bridge, right? Yeah, and it was changed and attributed to both Bob Hope and his father. So I think I think believe that's where it came from. And also, of course, you know, of course, Bob Hope had ownership of the Indians for over forty sure. years. Sure. Yep. Yep, and he did. and Bob Hope used to babysit oh. you. Is that right? Yeah, me and my older brother Harry. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, my my dad had been working with him uh, during the World War. You know, after World War II with uh, the USO. Right. They had kind of put the USO together, and um, and they just had become really good friends. They went through a thing called the cur curtain pullers here in Cleveland, which was the Cleveland Playhouse together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, I guess every now and then, so my parents could get a night out on the town, Bob and Dolores would come and stay with me and my brother. I think we lived maybe, you know, a block or two away from them at the time. So what was it like being babysat by Bob and his wife? I wish I could remember. You if there remember. weren't pictures, I would have not. <laughs> I mean, I was two and three, you know, oh, okay. my brother was, you know, four and five at the time. <laughs> How many people can say that? I mean, yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I want to mention right off as well. Um, Otis Redding, he spent the night bef before at the he had a TV appearance appearance and he was playing cards at your house yeah and after the tv appearance is that when his plane went down and he passed away well he did the tv show at like okay. one in the afternoon right is when they taped the show okay then he had a gig at leo's casino that night right so he played the gig and then the next morning got on the plane to madison and of course didn't make it um but I had spent that whole previous day with him. And the night before him and my dad were playing cards and, uh, you know, it was, um, he had done this show so many times. He was really a favorite of my dad's. And um, it, he was, that was like the first person I really knew that died. Right. Yeah. You know, I was probably 15 or 16 or something. I don't remember, but um, you know, I hadn't been, with somebody and then the next day they're gone yeah that never happened it was pretty intense mm. and of course his career really took off after that too i um, know it's a shame he had it? just come back from playing monterey pop and yeah was you know was just so excited about everything that was happening and um you know dock of the bay came out after he passed away and was really his first I guess you could say, you know, pop hit, mm -hmm. you know, he had written respect, of course, for Aretha. Right. And he had, uh, you know, some R and B hits with I can't turn you loose and satisfaction and stuff, but he really hadn't hit the pop charts until, uh, yep. until he hit with doc of the Bay. I remember listening to the radio <laughs> after, you know, a, a disc jack was playing and said, that's the last, last song he recorded after he died. <laughs> what, what kind of drug was he on <laughs> yeah I, I, I want to find out who the producer was you know? <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. I, I also you know i also talked to mitch Ryder, and he uh, was he performed i think one of the last songs with otis the Ryder. last song they knock did, on uh, wood i think wasn't it? knock on wood right yeah with the barquets yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny when I talked to Mitch Ryder, he did the interview at a doctor's office for his wife. <laughs> we were almost doing the same thing. So. Doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Not a great thing. interview. He was interrupted a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I gave him the video of that. Oh, man. Maybe 15 years ago or so. Right. And he 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 said, oh, man, I've told so many people about this who said, yes, yeah, sure, Mitch. And now he's got the DVD to show yeah, him. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Benjamin Orr of the Cars yep. was in the house beat house band. Uh, and so you know Benjamin as well, huh? 
Yeah, he was. Um, he had a band called the Grasshoppers. Right. And uh, they had a couple local singles. They were, you know, they were pretty much, uh, you know, one of our Beatle bands in Cleveland back in the 60s. Right. And um, yeah, he was in the house band. We remained friends. I, I spoke with him about 48 hours before he passed away. Mm. Um, we'd always stayed in touch. And um, uh, they played my bar mitzvah, actually. Wow. You know? Unbelievable. <laughs> incredible and i was i was honored to be asked to write the uh line the liner notes for his uh for yeah. his book and um yeah ben was he was a player man he was a really good guitar player a great mm -hmm. bass player a yeah. really good singer yep. um wrote some great songs um gone way too soon i love the cars they were so talented you know yeah benny had sent me i was on the radio at the time uh, I'd come back to the radio for one year mm -hmm. in 1978, I guess, wh whatever year that album came out. And, um, and he had sent me a test pressing of it. And I said, you know, can I play it on the radio? And he's like, well, you might be the only one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, they really didn't know what they had. They really didn't know what they had. And they were, man, they just changed the world in mm -hmm. about 24 hours. They were also pioneers. Nobody sounded yeah, like Yeah, absolutely. You know? That's what I mean. They didn't yeah. know what they had. And, and that yeah. sound, I'm, you know, I, I know they believed in the sound, but I'm not sure they believe they believed that everyone else would believe in the sound. Right. But that record hit fast and hard. I mean, yeah. it was just like bang out of the box. Yeah. Deservedly so. He was a good looking guy, too. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He had that look. And then Rick yeah, yeah. passes away, which yeah. blew me away. He was from Baltimore. I'm I'm from Baltimore no, I know originally. That. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. yeah. So. No, it was just um and that I, you know, I don't think we will ever know what really happened there. Mm. That happened pretty fast too. It did. <clears throat> there's just so many legends so many greats that are gone now it, it's it's heartbreaking you know i i've written well, a book i'm going to send you my book it's called the rockstar chronicles and I've, I've done so many interviews so a lot of interviews are in there but the first chapter everybody's gone already you know it's very I mean, sad uh, you know in, in one year uh, people that were not just my you know, people that I was huge fans of, but they mm -hmm. were my friends. Yes. You know, lose, losing Glenn Fry for me was, um, yeah. I, I, I've known Glenn, I've known Glenn since I was like 14. Yep. And uh, I can't even count the amount of baseball games we went to together. Mm. And, uh, and David Bowie that same year and, uh, and George Michael that same year. I didn't know George, but I was right. certainly a big fan. Um man it just uh it just keeps happening it just yeah. keeps happening i mean who would believe i mean seriously you look at the allman brothers mm -hmm. the only the only guy is still alive is dicky and jamo yeah something's wrong. something's <laughs> wrong know? right you look at the beach boys and brian wilson is the mm -hmm. only wilson still alive <laughs> I, I you know you look at the rolling stones and 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 you know <laughs> we've lost around. brian and we you know <laughs> but keith is still kicking me i know it's crazy you know it's uh you, it, there's no rhyme or reason for it you know there isn't and dickie dickie said to me his his brother passed away a few years ago and yeah and uh he said well it's that time of life mm-hmm you know, we're, we're over 70. It's, it's inevitable that we're going to start losing people. You know, I don't want to accept it. I, I don't even want to accept my age because <laughs> inside and, and you too, you're, you're like, yeah, you're back I'm in your radio days. <laughs> I'm 28. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, when I was going to be 70, I was having a big problem with it. Yep. And I was talking to Paul Rogers about it because he had mm -hmm. turned 70 the year before. Right. And I, I said, you know, was it why is this such a big deal i mean 50 was nothing 60 was nothing 40 was nothing you know but 70 all of a sudden just seemed like insurmountable it does and he said i'm going to send you this link and he sent me this link 
and there's an interview with Toby Keith. Mm -hmm. And he's telling this story about how he um, had just had breakfast with Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. And Clint Eastwood was telling him that he was going to turn 82 next week. So this is probably about 10, 12 years ago this took right. place. And, uh, and he says, so what are you doing for your birthday? He says, well, I'm starting a new movie. I wrote it. I'm directing it. I'm starring in it. It was that movie, The Mule. Mm -hmm. He says, where do you get the energy at 82? He said, I don't let the old man in. Exactly. He says, what does that mean? He said, it means if I have to go, you know, hook up with a young lady to make me feel young or go watch <laughs> a movie that makes me feel young or yeah. listen to a song that makes me feel young. That's what yeah. I'm going to do. Exactly. I'm just right. not going to let him in. Yeah. So Toby wrote a song called Don't Let the Old Man In. Mm -hmm. And the key to the song is in the chorus. He's got a line that says, if you didn't know when you were born, how old would you be? Right. That's true. And all of a sudden I was fine because I've been 28 since I was 12. <laughs> you know, when I first talked to you on the phone, I says, this can't be him. This guy sounds like he's uh, 25 years old. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was 28. You were You're 28. Close. I was close. <laughs> By That's the way, funny. who's in that picture behind you? Is that Kenny Loggins? With, with the guitar? Yeah. That's me. <laughs> oh, that's you. That's me, yeah. Oh. with the guitar yeah interviewing the yeah, legends i'm i'm the host <laughs> it looks like it looks like kenny <laughs> that's what i'm thinking i never saw kenny play a strat <laughs> <laughs> i i told right. um jim messina when when he was on uh midnight special he looked like um uh, keanu reeves if you look at him <laughs> he looks like keanu oh, reeves he, i can see that you know. <laughs> I know he said, Jim really? Well. I do. I do. I can see that. <laughs> I can definitely see that. I know. It's so cool. Two people I admire talking about age. One of them you you uh, worked with was Petula Clark. She's still mm -hmm. she's still out there doing plays. I've interviewed Petula. I love her. She's so cool. Uh, she's Isn't the grandmother awesome? I never had. You know, she is so <clears throat> awesome. And John Mayall is the other guy who just now stopped touring. He's not going to tour anymore, but I, I oh, keep really? in contact oh, with John Mayo. We'll see about that. <laughs> um, you know, I, got to, I, I went to the, um, uh, they did a tribute to um, uh, Peter Green. Peter Green, yeah. In London a couple of years ago, right before COVID, actually. Right. And I went there and uh, I went to the show and uh, John Mayo played at that. Uh -huh. He came running out on the stage playing yep. harp. And everybody was just like, oh, my God. I mean, nobody, it was crazy. He was amazing. He was just amazing. He's up there playing with David Gilmore and Pete Townsend. And Steven Tyler was the singer. Zach Starkey mm. playing drums. It was, it was an amazing night. Really a fun night. I was with John Mayall for his 80th birthday <laughs> in Sarasota. And... Uh, you know they gave him a cake and this and that sure. and whatever but he, like you said he set up his own equipment he was out there signing autographs for his new cd you know i mean he, he's an amazing guy he really is and he's a legend the guy's a legend absolutely i mean yeah. he's a, he's a real legend yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly um a lot of your friends are my friends as well jimmy fox i just had jimmy uh, on the yes. show we're having lunch tomorrow. I'll tell, tell him, him I said hi. hi. Okay. Yeah. He's a good guy. Love yeah, I see Jimmy quite a lot. We're, we yeah. live about maybe eight minutes away from each other. Oh, wow. He does a great impression of Joe Walsh. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing with Joe is you spend some time with, oh, all of a sudden you just start turning into what he does, man. That's so funny. What does Joe think about your impression? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I've had the balls to. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, we used um, to do radio together. Joe and I used to yeah. do radio. Yeah. And uh, I would be his engineer and mm -hmm. co-host and we would mm -hmm. go across the country and uh, and do morning shows when their hosts were going to be on, you know, off for the week. We'd right. go in and fill in for the week. 
And uh, and I'd throw the Joe impression in there at some point. <laughs> that doesn't sound anything like me. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. When my headphones, it does. You know? <laughs> I remember one time, all these for some reason, everybody was calling and requesting Steve Miller. And Joe says to me, you know, those all sound the same, you know. So we put on five different Steve Miller songs and played them at the same time. It sounded good. It was nice to have five CD, you know, players that we could use. But yeah, uh, we had a, that. That was a fun time going and doing. I mean, we sat in for Howard Stern. Did you really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Joe was kind of like the, the the permanent guest host for a week. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I could talk to you about radio for hours. You know, I uh, I went I to broadcasting it. school, and um, it was owned by CBS back in the late seventies. But back then, we, we needed an FCC license. So I had the first, second, and third FCC ticket. Yeah. And then as soon as I got my license, they got they got rid of it. And that I was know. like your ticket to big stations, you know? I know. I, I had to go up to Detroit to do it. Right. And I thought, n- nobody prepared me for it. I didn't know I needed to, to, I didn't know I needed to learn Morse code. It was hard. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell is this stuff? <laughs> And then, of course, like you, I didn't need it. Yeah, you didn't need it yeah. after a while, which was which was crazy. Wouldn't it I, be cool if radio was like it was back oh then? You could play God. anything you wanted. You didn't have to talk if you didn't want to. You could just let the music tell the story. Exactly. Well, the DJs were in command back then. Yeah. You, know, you must have had a great time. Uh, I, uh, well, my whole time, I'm wishing I could do Top 40. Really? I love oh, top man, 40. I, would, I, I, I filled in on at a station here in Cleveland once. Right. I had that. I mean, you go scream for three <laughs> hours. How great is that? I know. I had an eight hour show. <laughs> an eight hour show? Yeah, because they were shorthanded. I was, oh I was in God. Annapolis. The, sta- the station I worked at in Annapolis is owned by Pat Sajak now. He bought the oh, station. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I used to do three hours. I'd get mm-hmm. out of there and I'd be like, oh, I got to go take a nap. <laughs> it was so much fun, though, hitting those, hitting the, hitting the vocal. Yep. I mean, there's nothing yeah. like that. There, I, had, de- I had to run the AM and FM. The FM was a 50,000 watt beautiful music automated station. Right. Yeah. And I had to run both stations at the same time. Because, you know, they didn't want to hire anybody else to watch it. <laughs> oh, that's just crazy. Yeah. But we got some good stories, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Mark Farner, huh? I know him, but Brother Mark. Yeah. He's, de- I mean, he's literally my brother. I, I mean, love we him. We grew up together, you know. It's, um, yeah. He's it's... my, pro- definitely my oldest friend in the business. Really? And I didn't know until my book came out. Yeah. Because, because uh, the guy who wrote it, um, I didn't get to see any of the stuff he did with all of my artists. He talked to mm-hmm. a bunch of them. And I found out that I sang on I'm Your Captain. Really? Is that I right? I totally had spaced that. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, they were doing all those albums here in Cleveland. And yeah. Mark stayed at our house. And I'd go to work with him every night, you know. And I, I'm, I'm kind of glad I don't remember a lot of what went on back there. But um <laughs> But I, 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 after he mentioned it, after I read it, I'm like, you know what? I do remember this, that we mm-hmm. were all in front of a mic and everybody's just doing the, you know, the I'm your captains and, you know, closer Incredible. to home. And, um, so yeah. Everybody listens very carefully to I'm your captain. You'll hear David Sparrow in the background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got on a couple of Walsh records, Michael Stanley records. I, I've pushed myself on Good. it. On a few of them, you know. Why not? (laughs) Yeah. They owe it to you. (laughs) That's how I look at it. I I was so devastated about Jesse, though. I mean, his son, you know? Yeah. When he passed away. Oh, my gosh. We used to talk about his progression. And I remember he kind of he fell in love with the nurse that was taking care of him. And uh, my wife's a nurse, so... It was very, very difficult. He, Mark is such a nice guy, you know, and, and I just hate it because they never it's... got back together again. And Mark says he's okay with it. He's okay with a reunion, but I think it's, you know, who. 
who I've had on no, the show I as mean, well. Believe me, we've had a lot of attempts uh, for different reasons and for whatever. Yeah. Um, you can't pull it the off. The reality of it is, it's 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 just not worth getting through all the all the bull, you know, the red tape, paperwork, and all that crap. Well, not that part. No? Just just mentally with the people involved. But how cool would that be to to have the original oh, it would members? Be wonderful. It would be wonderful because all three of them can still bring it. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had, you know, Donnie's version of the band uh, open a show for Bad Company uh, mm-hmm. right, right before COVID. Right. And um, I mean, I thought they, I thought they were, they were amazing. They were great. Yeah. I mean, Max Carl, who I also used to manage, mm-hmm. uh, is the lead singer. Um, I don't think those songs are tailored to him. Right. But musically, it was, it was really, really good. It was really good. You know, and Mark, if you've seen Mark, I mean, he kills it. He's, he's incredible. <laughs> he's in the same key, yep. playing the guitar solos like he always did. I mean, yep. uh. great at keyboards. And he was too. Grand Funk. I he mean, was Grand no Funk. Doubt. I agree with yeah. you 100%. He is Grand Funk. Everybody knows that, too. Yeah. Well, except you know? for Donnie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't want to say, but I've had Don on the show too. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, nice guy, but you know. No, I, almost... listen, I grew up with those guys. They're, yeah. they're all dear friends, and it's it 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 kills me to have to be in the middle of it all. I know, know? I know. And Mark's wife's so nice too. She's yeah, cool. Lisa. Yeah. yeah, Lisa's cool. I've been trying. I'm been finagling trying to get the original heart together. I know all those guys too. Uh, and, uh, well, I worked with Howard Lease because he was with, uh, you know, Bad Company. That's right. Yep. But it's hard. There's there's a lot of friction there, too. So I don't. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, Ann moved down there, right? She's, She's in, in Florida. Florida now. I just yeah. I just interviewed Ann and I just saw her oh, show. Okay. She's good. She's really good by herself. Yeah. A friend of mine has been working in the studio with her. So, yeah. Fierce Bliss. That's a new album. Ah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, I just saw her at the Hard Rock. I was guest of theirs at the Hard Rock in uh, Tampa. And she uh-huh. did a phenomenal show. She's amazing. Really good show. Yeah, I she's I mean, you amazing. know, it's a, 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 people always ask me about, you know, well, what do you listen to now? It's like, well, I listen to what I always listen to because it's the best music out there. Yep. I mean, it's ma- not to say there aren't new things that are great. There are. But I mean, you know, yep. who sells out stadiums? Nobody. Not kids. You know, <laughs> no. No. is there anybody you would like to manage that, that you know, like a newer artist that, uh... you know, I, I, I have a couple that I work with now. Right. Um, and it's hard finding the young artists that don't think they know everything. Right. And the bottom line is they probably do know everything. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I still, I'm old school and, mm-hmm. um, and I'll die old school. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping it up right now. I mean, I you think, I, yeah, I, 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 I basically doing stuff, whatever I need to do for Dickie Betts in regards to the Allman brothers, yeah. um, you know, reissues and documentaries that are being made and, you know, all of the business of, of the business. Uh, working with Bad Company uh, and Paul Rogers. Yeah. Uh, Paul's going to have a new album coming out this year, um, which we're really excited about. He, um, you know, during COVID, he got bored, went into the studio just to kind of play around. Next thing mm-hmm. he knew, here's a bunch of songs. Hmm. So um, he's going to be the first new artist on a very famous label that has kind of been dormant for a while. Oh, okay, cool. We'll I let miss, the press release the tell it all. <laughs> you know what? I always wanted to be an A and R guy. I'd be great at that because I review a lot of albums now, and I always tell them this this sure. could have been a hit, especially back yeah. in the top forty days. You know, I I would, but they don't have that anymore, do they? Do they? No, still have I, listen. I, it's funny because. Um, when, when I was listening to Paul's record the other mm-hmm. day, I'm thinking, oh, this would be such a smash. But yeah. 
you know, who's going to buy music from 70 year old musicians? I hate that. You know? it, that's why I do what I'm doing. I keep the music alive, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's important. It's important because they've still got something to say. Exactly. And, and they're better than they ever were. Yeah. I know you a know? couple of guys that need management. If you ever, you know, I mean, Les Dudek needs a manager. I just talked to him. Ah, if you well, would, you, know. you know, Les and Dickie had their I differences. Know. So <laughs> I know <laughs> that wouldn't go over well. When I know Dickie the story. Says, so what are you doing? <laughs> I know the story. <laughs> yeah. You know, Dick Dickie only leaves like 20 minutes from me here. He's in, you know, Sarasota and I'm in. Yeah. Bradenton. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you exactly? I'm in Bradenton. Oh, you're oh, so he's an Osprey. So it's not yeah. even twenty minutes. Yeah. We're really close. I covered um a couple of his um um benefit shows. He he did a benefit for a little girl. Oh yes, of course. I was there. And and um there's a lot of people there. I covered the show and they wanted to know if I wanted to interview him like spur of the moment. And I said, No, man, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> you know, I always prepare for these <laughs> interviews. But uh, they had Dan Toller was there, and and I met his son, who, who Dwayne, who's a really gifted guitar player. The guy's oh great. my gosh, yeah, the stuff he did with Devin Almond is amazing. Yeah. Um, they're going to get back together in the fall, so that would be good. Good, yeah. You close your eyes, you can't tell if it's sticky or you know. I know Is that good. <laughs> no, it's and, and you know, and and he's um, he's a really good singer. He's a very different singer than yep. Dickie. Um, and I, I thought that, you know, the thing with him and Devin, I thought it's just magic. I, you mm -hmm. know, once they get back together, that'll be good. The Almond Brothers were so great, man. They were, yeah. You know, they, you don't, you'll never get that again. It'll never happen again. Music like that. It really no. won't. It's, I mean, the first time I saw them, they were opening for Al Cooper. Yep. I've had Al on the show. He's a funny yeah. guy. Yeah. Al is wonderful. He's, He's a friend of yours. He, you go way back Very, without Cooper. Yeah. Yeah. He was another one of those guys that when he was in town, they, you know, always stayed at my parents' house. You know, I used to spend my summers with Al. I used to, um, we'd have a two week break from upbeat in the middle mm -hmm. of the summer. So I'd go in and live with Al in the village. Mm -hmm. And, um, in, uh, in 1969, mm -hmm. he, I went up there and, and it was during the middle of August. I, it seemed that it was always around my birthday, August 15th. And Al said, uh, hey, you know, everybody who's playing at Woodstock is rehearsing at the uh, Fillmore East. Let's go over there. We went over there and we watched everybody rehearse. Wow. <laughs> we didn't have any mud. We had our own bathroom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we saw The Who and Hendrix and Janice and uh, Sly. That was the first time I'd ever seen Sly. It was pretty amazing. I love Sly, you know? Yeah. Is your birthday August 15th? Yeah. That's my wife's birthday. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yes. That's my brother's birthday, too. He's You're... two years older than me. My, my wife was born in 1955. Ah. Oh, you kids. All you kids. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Hey, you're younger than me. You're what, 28? What, 24? What's that? <laughs> you're, what, what are you, What's 24? Oh, 25? Yeah, 28. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of your friends, I think, is it Charlie Brusco, right? Charlie Brusco? Yeah. yeah. He, he's with, um, is it Red Light Management now? Yeah, we were partners. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I just, I know Amanda Kagan from that group, and she's oh, the one course. who. She sent me with Ann Wilson, and I was just also say, she works with Hart. Yeah, yeah, and Lawrence Gowan from Sticks. They work with the yeah. Sticks too. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, Lawrence is what a, you know, he's such a big star up in Canada. Really? Yeah, I mean, he goes up there, and Tommy's his side man, Tommy uh -huh. Shaw. And uh, there, he had a band with his brother called the McGowan, the, the Gowan Brothers. Hmm. and um they were smoking at one point in the 70s i mean yeah. they were really a cool band yeah and he's he's a great singer great keyboard player and an amazing performer he's kind of took over sticks in a way yeah 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 i he, he's a funny guy too he's you know oh very much so it's funny because ann zoomed in two hours early on our interview so she came on when lawrence was on with me Mm -hmm. 
And I said, sticks meet heart, heart meet sticks. <laughs> you know, and they said they, they had dinner together at one time. And you right. Know, but yeah, of course. Of course. It was really we cool. We all run into each other. I mean, it's a small world on the road. You know? It is. It is. I'm going to bring some points up now from your book because I loved it. Uh, first of all, your parents were in witness protection. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in the fifties, my dad was, um, he produced a boxing show. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the mob pretty much started between Youngstown and Cleveland Those guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you go to the mob museum in, in, uh, Las Vegas, there's a right. great museum called the mob. Muse it's all about Cleveland. Very it's cool. all about a street I can see while we're talking right now. Huh. <laughs> Anyhow, the mob had decided that, uh, you know, certain people should win and certain p people should lose the boxing mm -hmm. matches. And my dad was not willing to let that happen. And uh, they were in a, my parents were in a, I guess you couldn't call it a traffic accident. It was a traffic on purpose. Ooh, man. And uh, next thing I knew, we were moving down to North Carolina and we had, uh, you know, someone taking us to school every day and wow, what a life. I mean, I was, yeah. I was six or seven. I don't remember much of it. I remember it happening. Yeah. My older brother has a pretty good rec rec uh, recollection of it, huh. but yeah, Man. weird times, you know, that's interesting, you know, made for good reading in the book. That's for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Another, um, very interesting fact. Um, Pete Towson. <laughs> well, you know, we all had our we all had our days when you know uh, drinking or drugs took over our lives, <laughs> and um, and I was with Pete at a moment of um, unclarity, mm -hmm. and uh, he was pretty sure I was the guy that was feeding Joe Walsh drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, and right. that would lead to that's the exactly death of... what you want as a manager <laughs> yeah exactly um and i i told him i said pete you know i'm clean and sober i think mm -hmm. i was clean and sober 20 some years by that point and um you know he would just kind of went off and um you know a while later when he got sober uh, i got a call from him and uh he wanted to meet up and we did and we had a a wonderful conversation right and we've been pretty good friends ever since we were friends before now we're even better friends yeah yeah and you're good friends with keith moon as well right well i knew keith i wouldn't right. say pretty good friends i knew him um yeah. he one time uh handcuffed me to a radiator <laughs> at a concert that i was supposed to come and mc and and introduce the who right and uh he was goofing around. He goes, oh, you know, I got these handcuffs. You know, they're magic. You can just, if you pull them, they come right apart. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm sure we had indulged in everything before that. And next thing I know, I'm like hooked up to this radiator in his dressing room. <laughs> and he goes, well, see ya. We got to do a show. <laughs> of course. And I heard the whole show from up there. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm really... I was oh, way God. too high, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> J Jimmy Jimmy Fox had some good Keith Moon stories as well. Well, you know, yeah. it was kind of cool back then because Joe and Pete used to share a car. Right. If they were in the UK, Pete would drive and mm -hmm. Joe would go with Pete. And uh, Dale Peters and, and John Entwistle would do it, would go together. And mm -hmm. Keith and, and Jimmy Fox would go together. And Roger always preferred to drive by himself. So it was kind of fun for them. You know, they got, they got to... Uh, you know kind of live it in fact a lot of people don't realize this but the opening act for live at leeds was the james gang hmm. they played the show that became the album live at leeds right who was i just talking to about uh oh that oh that was les dudick uh -huh. he was talking about him with steve miller and in the spur of the moment steve miller wanted him to be in his band that opened up for pink floyd in london all of a sudden i mean it's like a mm -hmm. 
you know, no rehearsal, nothing. Let's go. You know, we're going to London and he just realized, wait a minute, that's Pink Floyd. We're opening up for Pink Floyd, you know? So, he, yeah, I love these stories. <laughs> these wait, stories what, are great. What, what, <laughs> you know, listen, stuff like that happens, you know, yeah. the guy that replaced Lou Gehrig, you know? All yeah. of a sudden, hey, go play first. <laughs> Lou's got a stomach ache. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I love the Indians. You know, I grew up collecting baseball cards, of course. And one of my favorite uh, pitchers of all time was Sam McDowell. Sutton you know? Sam. And Louis yeah. Tiant of the yeah. Indians. You know, they had a great team back then. I mean, they weren't great, but I love the players, you know. They always, oh, Rocky Calavito. Calavito. Vic yeah. Davileo and That's right. um, Johnny Temple and <laughs> Leon, Leon Wagner. Wagner. Yeah, Daddy Leon Wags. Wagner. <laughs> yeah. I can still see you those know, baseball cards on my head, you know. My roommate for a while, for right. like four or five years, was Mudcat Grant. No, you're kidding me. Yeah, Mud he was Cat? in my wedding. Yeah, he was oh, in my wedding. Man. He signed autographs all the way down the aisle. Oh, wow. Great <laughs> picture, man. He was oh. a wonderful friend. One of my dearest friends in life. Always got him mixed up with Grant Jackson. <laughs> well, you you know, there was a baseball card that was done. There was a mistake baseball card like that. Oh, really? Is that right? Yep. The Grant yeah. Jackson card has Mudcat on it. Grant Jackson was uh, at the Orioles fantasy camp because he, I think he played with the Orioles just for like a year or for so. For a half hour. Yeah, yeah for a half an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those guys, both of those guys passed away. A lot of baseball players pass away early also. I know. You know? Well, you know, they, the, the guys who played in the 50s and 60s, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was tough. Yeah. They're taking trains from New York to California, yep. you know, and then playing a game. And they smoked a lot. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't see how they did that. I, uh, and I was the at pills, the bar. I mean, they were all on pills. They were all taking. Yeah, pills, that's true. You know, <clears throat> yeah. I was at the bar with Pat Dobson during the fantasy camp thing and one uh -huh. pack after another, man, you know, he was asking me to get him cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, <laughs> and then you think of what, what was his name? The guy from the, I think the Cubs who mm -hmm. pitched a game while he was on through a no hitter while he was on an Aston. Really? Wow. I'm trying to think who that was. In the sixties or seventies. I think seventies, Jim Bibby, maybe. Okay. That sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he did acid while he was pitching a no hitter. <laughs> wow, he probably did good. Yeah, he did good. He got a no hitter. Yeah, See? there's some yeah. benefits to it. And then Bill Lee used to put you Bill know Lee. pot on his uh, cereal. You know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wow. didn't call him Spaceman for nothing. <laughs> but you know what's weird is uh, when we did the Walsh Fry tour, mm -hmm. one of the things Glenn said was, "Let's book it." so we can see as many baseball games as possible yeah because the back you know back in the early 90s everybody was playing you know day games all the time right you know there were a lot of day games <clears throat> and i think we we hit like 17 or 18 we got to see 17 or 18 different stadiums that summer Jeez, that's it great. was so much fun but for <clears throat> one reason or another it seems like the kansas city royals were in every city we were in Hmm. That's what we saw the Royals play everybody. <laughs> and we're all in the same hotels and you know, you get to know those guys. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. We're kind of on the same moving cycle, except we move every day, they move every four days. Yeah. You know? It's a lot of a lot of traveling, man. Sure it is. Really is. Absolutely. Yeah. You and Walsh were in the same uniform. What what game was that? Ah, well, you know, I I used to help. Um, there's a, the major league alumni did all of these fundraisers down in Florida. Okay. Um, and uh, in St. Petersburg right. is where it started. Close to me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I used to bring in entertainment for those games. They were mm -hmm. old timers games. Right. There'd be yeah. a golf tournament, old timers game, and then a dinner auction. Huh. And uh, so I bring, I brought Joe down there. I brought uh, Eric Carmen there. I brought, uh, oh man, um, the Nelson kids. Mm -hmm. uh, every year I'd bring somebody else different. I brought Glenn Fry down there once. Mm -hmm. um, and we all get to play in the games. That was, yeah. that was the deal. What position did and, you play? 
Um, I would try to play like third base because yep. old guys can't pull the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all right-handed back then you know? yeah but um i was i was facing bert blylevin once mm-hmm. and i i'd known bert from cleveland right. greatest curveball in the world yeah and you know he was telling me oh, he, i'm knocking you down i'm you know you better be careful all this <laughs> and i get up there and he throws this curveball that that looked like a basketball as it was coming in and i i hit it and I took it to right field and I'm standing on first base. Carlton Fisk is playing first base. Oh, gee. And he says to me, come on, man. What? You don't take a lead off. Come on. This is your, your, this is big league baseball. Take a lead off. As soon as I go to take the lead off, of course, he tags me out. He had the ball in his glove. Oh, the old tr- and Bly trick Levin turns, ball. Yeah. Trick Bly play. Levin turns to me and says, come on, Spiro. Did you think <laughs> I was going to let you get a hit off me? <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Those were fun games. I, I mean, one time I was playing in the outfield with Ricky, Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson. I mean, Ricky Henderson, man. My God. You, you know, that's a long throw from third base to first base. I play third base, too. Yeah, I always played third base. That was my yeah. place. Closest to the bench. <laughs> well, my hero is Brooks Robinson. So oh, I got to man, play with Brooks. I, I got to play I with Brooks. I signed jersey from him in my jer- in my uh, office. Yeah. What a humble guy. But uh, fantastic. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful guy. Yeah. Uh, my wife used to, you know, do margaritas with Tug mm-hmm. McGraw. You know, yep. <laughs> we had yeah. a good time down there. I know. Yeah, I love sports. I'm, you know, rock and roll and sports, they go hand in hand. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, every musician wants to be a baseball player. Yeah, exactly. And every baseball player, you know, wants to be a musician. So, yep. I mean, you know, the grass is always greener, as they say. But on baseball, you get to see it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Every once in a while, I'll get to do a sports figure. I did Rick Barry recently, which was cool. Oh, he, nice. He lives That's around cool. here. He lives, he lives like 10 State. minutes from me. Yeah. Yeah, Rick Barry is cool. He was a nice guy, you know. Uh, a lot they're of people all, give him know, a lot of crap. Ninety nine percent of them are all good guys. Yeah, they're all good guys. I mean, you know, my list of assholes is very short. Very short. Yeah, I haven't had one guy I've had trouble with of all the rock stars I've interviewed. Not one, which is incredible. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Yeah, not one. Because I know how much they dreaded it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to know. Just kidding, Ray. Just kidding. I had a disagreement well with Jeff Tate from Queensryche, but that was it. It was just a disagreement. Uh, well, there you go. There you go. I think the only interview I ever did that I had got into an argument with was Ozzy Osbourne. Really, you and, and Ozzy? I had him. I was on a station called WNCR in Cleveland. It was the first of those you right. know underground stations. Yep. And Ozzy came in and he was just like, not even close. And this is like in 72 or three, yep. whatever that first album came out. And I made some comment, you know, about, you know, I, I think I asked him if he was paranoid, you mm-hmm. know, like what makes you write a song like paranoid. Right. And he just like went off. Really? He just totally went off on me. Huh, that's unusual. You know, obviously, yeah. I don't understand how songs are written. That songs yeah. can be an influence from many things. They're not necessarily just personal recollections. And mm-hmm. why would I think that he's like, well, you're kind of acting it right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you proved my point. <laughs> yeah, I think he was the only one. And then huh. later on in, uh, man, this has got to be like 2006 or seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was with Yusuf and we were doing... Um, we're down in DC on the mall down there with right. uh, John John Stewart and mm-hmm. uh, Cole, Stephen Colbert. Mm-hmm. I forgot they did this big rally for rally for reality or whatever it was, mm-hmm. and they had this idea to have Yusuf open it by singing "Peace Train." Mm-hmm. And in the middle of the song, Ozzy comes up and pushes him away from the mic and starts doing uh, "Crazy Train." Really. And then they're back and forth, each, you know, trying to rule the mic. And then yeah. finally Colbert comes out and he says, enough of this, enough of this. And and then out come the OJs doing Love Train. <laughs> and it was hysterical. That's crazy. Huh. The night before for the rehearsal, 
uh, Yusuf had just come in from Dubai and he was mm -hmm. really tired. And I had to teach Peace Train to Ozzy. Oh, gosh. And he had to teach me Crazy Train so I could teach it to Yusuf. Oh, my goodness. And, and sitting with him, it, one of the funniest times, I mean, Mm -hmm. God, we laughed so hard. It was probably two o'clock in the morning. Mm. Um, everybody's very excited about this show coming yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, Stevie Wonder was on it, and Sheryl huh. Crow, and um, uh, Tony Bennett. Uh, what every, a mixture! Every everybody was there, man. It was it yeah. was back. That was my most fun backstage. Was at uh, that show. Very cool. When I was a kid, me and my dad, my dad had uh, retail stores in D.C. for years, retail mm -hmm. electronics. I even wrote a book about it called Check the Cheese. That's me wow. in the front cover. It's, His name I'm wasn't Crazy that. Eddie, was it? It wasn't Crazy Eddie, was it? No, but they're, they were kind of related to us. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'll say, I'm going to send you both books, by the way. Please, I would you'll love get a, to. You'll, would you'll get a that. kick out of it. You'll get a kick out of it. So we were on 13th and F Street in D.C., so when I was about 14, I guess, Bob Hope and Billy Graham did a big Fourth of July thing. And Anne Margaret was going to be on it. I wanted to see Anne Margaret because I was always in love with Anne Margaret. So we went there and the- That was Yippies, a long line, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a very long line. I, yeah. I, I still love her. <laughs> <laughs> she still looks great. <laughs> But um, do, you, do you know Anne? <laughs> I met her. I met her once, and her opening line was, "Am I the first person you've met that's fuck, that fucked Elvis?" You're kidding me. And I said to her, "No." Wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> Interesting. I knew another <laughs> singer from the '70s that we've already talked about that was in that same situation. <laughs> Man, yeah, they were really close. Yeah. Very, very close. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, we it was on the mall. And the Yippies started trouble. There was the hippies, of course, the Yippies right. and Abby yeah. Hoffman and all that. And the police tear gassed them and the tear gas floated our way and everybody oh got God, tear gas. Oh. And ki little kids, families. So we were running. We ran a mile away from the tear gas and our eyes were burning. So I never got to see oh. the show. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, that's what happens in the '60s, you know. Yeah, I, I saw all she kinds was a of very stuff. Sweet lady. I mean, Anne was very sweet lady. Very yeah. sweet lady. Yeah, she's got an album out. She she did a Christmas thing. And oh, she's done a bunch of albums over the years. Yeah, but she's still she's still out there rocking and rolling, you know. She's I mean, incredible. I saw her. I, I don't know how old she was. I mean. <clears throat> I saw her sometime in the 2000s. She looked mm -hmm. great. Yeah, yeah she still looked great. And Raquel Welch still looks good too. Yeah, I, that I haven't had a chance to see, but I'll trust you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed Trini Lopez and the the New York Times. Did you do that piece. thing for you? That da, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> before he died, but he. Uh, I hope. Yet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a relationship with Joey Heatherton. That's right. I do That's, remember that. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. So, so I have this book out. It's called The Life in the Wings. Yep. Just thought I'd hype it. Okay. Um, one, I'm going to mention some <laughs> things here. It's a great book. Let me, The Velvet Underground, you mentioned. Yes. Had believed to have the only national TV appearance was on was your on dad's Upbeat. show on yep. Upbeat. That's incredible. And That's... just a few minutes ago, another friend of mine from Florida just called me and says, guess okay. what I have? And I said, what? He says, I, have, I found a bunch of stills, pictures of the Velvet Underground on Upbeat. You're kidding me. Wow. No, they're probably on my phone right now, but I, I can't look at them because huh. I'm like doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I, they used to play a club called macabre which was right down right. the street from the tv station yeah and um you know it was uh every, it was the thing everybody who played whatever club you played at whether it was the r&b club or the rock club or the folk mm -hmm. club everybody did upbeat i mean you know uh that's what made the show so special because we had every genre mm -hmm. you know um, jazz people would come. Yeah. Gene Krupa did upbeat. 
you know, what, one of the Doc greatest Severinsen. drummers ever. Yeah. Yeah. Jack yeah. Dever, Doc Severinsen did it. I mean, uh, mm. you know, Jerry Lewis did it when he had mm. his little talking record, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember that. It was but, an interesting time, yeah. you know, to grow up and be with all of those people at the same time. And you had a lot um, of these guys from the um, upbeat show to visit you on the radio when you got in radio. Yeah. Like yeah. Mark I, Farner and Jimmy Page. Yeah. I mean, Mark used to come all the time. I, Mm -hmm. I, I first I was doing an all night show on a station called WXCN in Cleveland. Yep. And um, I was working at a clothing store. And I, my job at the clothing store was basically just to play music while people shopped, <laughs> you know, play Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, so the guy said to me, hey, I can buy overnight radio for twenty five dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. And I only have to buy two hours, but you could do from midnight to six. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. So the very first show I did, it just happened to be the Yardbirds had done uh, Upbeat that day. And I mm -hmm. grabbed Jimmy and I said, hey, I'm doing a radio show tonight. Incredible. You want to come and do it with me? He goes, oh, can we, what, what are you going to play? I said, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And um, he went through my record collection and pulled out a whole stack and we basically went over there for six hours and played music and had Jimmy telling stories. Um, the nine people that heard it, I think probably enjoyed it. <laughs> well, they probably just heard the first hour, but you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember taking this. Do you remember Lord such? Yeah. Yeah. He had an album that had like everybody in the world on it. Mm -hmm. Guys from the stones, Beatles, kinks, mm -hmm. who every, everybody was on this record with him. And I had him over and I brought him over to do the, the show because uh, he had done Upbeat. Right. And I'd only heard the single that he had done on the show. And I thought, oh, well, we'll play this album. It was the worst thing I'd ever heard. I mean, it was just garbage. <laughs> um, I was pretty sure he was that same guy that did They're Coming to Take Us Away. <laughs> but yeah. I could never, pr I never saw him in the same place, but I huh. could never prove it. Yeah. WMMS Radio. Um, yeah. Kenny Youngman came to visit you with with your dad. And uh, there was a lot of smoke yeah. in the studio, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah, well, there was smoke. Uh, there weren't a lot of clothes. Um, How come I never went through people? that? I never went through that in radio. What it was oh, and you missed it, buddy. <laughs> I did, man. <laughs> And my dad brought, my dad and Henny were very good friends. And he wants to go show him, you know, here's my son, my son, the big DJ in Cleveland, you know. So he stops down the station and talks his way in. And uh, I had no idea he was about to open the door. And, you know, I'm smoking a joint, drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. Somebody else from the staff was getting it on with somebody in front of the music library um and uh there was another disc jockey who was about to go on who was also in the room and him and henny just kind of went at it it was kind of it was hysterical my dad didn't think so but um <laughs> you know he said you must be henny youngman i never mm -hmm. forget a tie and the guy said well what are you, <laughs> well, you what are you jesus christ the way you look with that beer and they're just zinging back and forth and they're both laughing their asses off and then my father just says, we'll talk later Yeah, and leaves. It sounds like a dad. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> Fortunately, the radio station was on top of a hotel. Oh, it was cool. the penthouse Very of a hotel. Cool. And we used to get rooms for like, I think, 12 bucks a night or six bucks or whatever oh, it was. Lucky you. So I called my mother and I said, uh, just had an incident. <laughs> I think I'm we'll going to stay out here for a few days. I'll come home and get some clothes during oh, the day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> My and first radio Saturday, gig. We had a, that Saturday, we had to do another upbeat show. So, you know, uh. I show up at the station and, you know, my dad's a professional. You know, nothing yeah. happened until. Right. You, know, it's you over. had a cool dad, though. You had a cool dad. I did. Yeah. I did. Very cool. I found out he did blow with Elvis once. That kind of, <laughs> that was one of the cooler things I heard. That's, that's something. You never you know, hear that Jay, about Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scoop, yeah, scoop. I know. <laughs> well, you know, Jay Black from Jane the Americans, right? 
my wife and I are having dinner with him one night and he says, um, you know, did your dad ever tell you, you know, that we did blow with Elvis? And I looked at him and said, my dad knew Elvis? <laughs> And he you says, forgot about the blow part, right? He said, yeah, that's what he said. I said, <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me, but he never told, I never knew he met Elvis. <laughs> that's real. <laughs> that's funny. That is so funny. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. My, my dad had drinks with Al Green in his dressing room. <laughs> that's ah. my, my dad's claim to fame. But he if did know a lot a of chance. those mafia guys, too. <laughs> yeah. If, you, yeah. if yeah. you ever get a chance, go down to Memphis when Al's at his church okay. and watch him testify, man. Really? You'll never, Walsh and I went and did that one day. It was amazing. Uh, wow. Yeah, I'd like to go. Definitely. Uh, you were the first one, one of the first ones to play uh, Stairway to Heaven on the air, huh? Yeah, it was a mistake. Was that your bathroom song? That was my bathroom <laughs> song. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. And a guy came in, he, uh, he brought me Zeppelin 4. And yeah. if you remember, Zeppelin 3 was a stiff. Right. right. And if Zeppelin 4 hadn't happened, they were going to drop the band. Huh. So this was a, a very important album for Atlantic. Yeah. And the guy brings it right into me. He says, just got this, you know, it's right. new Zeppelin. I'm looking, oh, well, there's a long song. Um, I'll put that on and go pee and then come back. <laughs> and the phones were out of control. Wow. Out, what is that? Who is that? And of course, you know, I probably played it three or four times yeah. during my show that day. And, yeah. Um, Very interesting. I mean, it's just, I, it was by chance that I had the test pressing and yeah. played it. And um, yeah, I think probably a few others played it after me. You got into managing after radio, and I, I guess it was Michael Stanley band, right? The first one. Yeah, he was the first person that I managed. <clears throat> How did you make that transition? That's I'm very curious about that. Um, it was weird because I, you know, it's when Joe was Walsh was spending a lot of time in Cleveland, and he used to right. come and hang out with me at the radio station, and we're just sitting there one day, and he said, uh, "So." I mean, you're not going to be doing this when you're 30, are you? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I doubt it. I was 19 at the time or 18. And he says, well, I think you should become a manager. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I think you have what it takes, you know, mm -hmm. to deal with an artist. Right. And I, I think it would be, you should do it. And then at some point you'll manage me. And I said, oh, <laughs> okay, well, that that's, I'm naive. I, I'll believe that. Um, and he brought me out to California with him and, and I followed his manager, Irving Azoff around right. for a bunch of months. And then he introduced me to Michael. He had been playing on my, he'd played on Michael's first album was playing mm -hmm. on the second album. Mm -hmm. They were about to go record it. Yeah. And he said, this is the guy you're going to manage. And, um, I said, okay. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and, um, Don Kirshner's rock concert was on at the time. Yep. I loved it. And I, and I knew that my dad was a good friend with, of Don's because yeah. all of Don's artists used to come and do the upbeat show. Yep. So um, I thought, well, we should get Michael on, on the Don Kirshner mm -hmm. rock concert, even though nobody ever heard of him. Right. So I, I asked my dad, you know, which, how do I do that? He said, we'll just give Don a call. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I guess that's what everybody does. So he gives me Don's number. Call Kirshner up. I said, hey, my dad said to call you. Mm -hmm. And I'd met him a few times. You know, it's not like I didn't know Don Kirshner. Yeah. Um, and I said, I got this artist, Joe Walsh, David Sanborn, guys from Manassas, Danny Fogelberg, Richie Fure. They're all on the record. He said, what well, do you think you could get them to come and do the TV show? And I said, I'm sure. <laughs> what did I know? <laughs> <laughs> So he said, well, if you can get them, I'll give you two segments on the show. Hmm. And, uh, and it did, they did. Everybody came in and did it. I think um, Jay Giles was the only one who couldn't do it mm -hmm. uh, just because of they were out playing or whatever. But right. Walsh got everybody else to come to the TV studio and uh, we rehearsed for a couple of days and they did an acoustic set and then came back and did the electric set. It was mm -hmm. amazing. 
Well, so you had somebody that believed in you, even though you've never been a manager before, but they, they saw it in you that you could do I it. Yes, yeah. Which I mean, great. I didn't believe in me, that's for sure. Yeah. I'm still waiting inc- to be found out. That's know? incredible. Thanks to Joe. You yeah. Know? I yeah. blame him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's great. He I like is, I like yeah. Joe Walsh as well. I mean, what what a you know, a history's hat, you know, I mean, I'd love the James gang, of course, you know, more than yeah, and one probably of, more. By the way, yeah. One of the most intelligent people yes. I've ever met in my life. He's so well read on what every I hear. subject. Yeah. yeah. That's what I hear. I saw Cat Stevens live at the Capitol Center. I worked at the Capitol Center in D.C. Yeah. Um, this was not 1974, May 3rd, 1974. I saw Cat Stevens. That's probably the last time he's ever toured for a long time. But I did not know that he was sick, even in the hospital, right? Yeah, he had tuberculosis. Nobody, nobody knew that until I read your book, you know? Oh, well, he, he's talked about it quite frequently. Really? I mean, that's I where he wrote, he wrote three albums when he was in the hospital. I, I had no clue. Mona Bone, Tea for the Tillerman, and... Right. Um, the one that was after T for the Tillerman with Moonshadow and everything on it. And ladies um, and gentlemen, David put Cat Stevens with Paul McCartney. And that's, yeah, that was not easy, but it happened. Um, it actually was incredibly easy. Really? Um, I made one phone call. Uh huh. Um, we were walking out of the studio. We're down in Nashville. Right. And it was a beautiful day. So we decided to walk back to the hotel. And Yusuf said to me, he says, you know, this one song I hear, I don't know why, but I hear Paul McCartney singing harmony on it. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, well, how well do you know him? He's never met him. I said, how can that be? He goes, well, we were in different circles, you know, yeah. different times. Um, <clears throat> so I said, well, you know, when I was at the Rock Hall, I dealt with his office a couple of times. And uh, I knew somebody that worked there. So I called there and I said, hey. Um, I'm working on this record with, with Yusuf, with Cat Stevens, and he wants to know if Paul will sing on it. And she told me, you know, right out front, listen, I mean, it's not something that he really does. Uh, he, you know, he sings on his friend's records or the other Beatles, but he, you know, I said, well, just, if you could just give him the message. She goes, well, of course I will. And I said, so here's Yusuf's number. Um, if he could call this number, uh, and and let him know if he if he's going to do it. Otherwise, if you could call me and let me know that he's not going to do it. So, five o'clock the next morning, I get a phone call and it says like unknown number or something. And I'm like, mm-hmm. eh, I don't do this at five thirty in the morning. But I thought, uh, what if it's like a hospital and it's right. my wife or my kid or something? And so I answer it. Right. I go, hello. And he says, uh, is Yusuf there? I said, mm-hmm. no, this is David. David, Paul McCartney. I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> comb my hair, brush my teeth real quick, you know, put a tie on or something. You know. He says, I get to sing with fucking Cat Stevens? And I said, yeah, if you yeah, want. That's great. And he said, well, look, you know, where are you guys? I said, well, we're in Nashville now. And he goes, oh, I thought you guys were over here. I didn't realize. I'm sorry to wake you up. I'm like, best wake up call I ever had, you know? <laughs> and like four or five days later, we're in the studio with Paul. And it was, um, it was pretty amazing. I have to tell you, it's, uh, as far as life highlights go there, with the exception of getting married and having a kid, it's right there at number three. It's got to be. Yeah. Boots and sand. Yep. Yep. Incredible. And he played the, uh, Dolly Parton's on that song. Uh, Alison Krauss is on that Gunnar Nelson. Um, Michelle Branch, Holly Williams, uh, Hank Jr.'s daughter. Mm. Yeah, it was a fun session. And it was a concert at the Kennedy Center in, back in, I think, 2016 or something like that, right? What? No, I'm not. Uh, Cat, what? Cat Stevens? Uh, didn't he do a concert at the Kennedy Center? Uh, mm. No? I thought he did. No. Huh. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. That's a possibility. I, right. well, I know he played the beacon that around the time he played the beacon. He made a, I just didn't remember being the Kennedy Center. 
a cat's uh, attic a cat's attic concert and i think i think i read that somewhere huh yeah huh well I, being a top 40 guy you know i love yusuf cat stevens because sure. so many i'm gonna hits, see him next, i'm gonna see him next week actually are you really where's he yeah. at where's he hanging He's out a, he'll be he'll be in london he'll be in london so you're gonna go to yeah, london to see him or yeah yeah, we're wow. gonna go hang for a few days. We're working on a couple projects that I can't talk about yet. But oh, <laughs> I hate when that happens. But I'm pretty excited about them. Well, after they happen, <laughs> let's connect and talk about them. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. and let's promote them and whatever. So you're still active, right? You're, yeah. you're saying you're not, but you are, and you are. You know, what am I gonna you're do? confusing me. No. <laughs> you can only watch so many court TV shows. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm doing projects. I, I just yeah. the other day, I was like sitting around thinking, am I, am I retired? And I didn't know the answer. You can't retire. But I guess I'm not if I'm still doing stuff. So no, you're a person that can't retire. It's impossible. No, I could never do it. You're still young, man. You look young. After, after hell freezes over, I tried to retire. Yeah. And yeah. then I got bored, and that's how I ended up at the Rock Hall for a couple of years. <laughs> Let me talk about the Rock Hall because there's sure. some bitterness there with a lot of people, especially Steve Always. Miller. With, with me. <laughs> oh, I can give you, you know, I, I can give you a list so long of just people that I can't believe aren't in there. Why? And then I can give you a longer list of people that okay. are in there that okay. don't belong. Okay, why? One question to you. Why? Why what? I don't why know what are is. so many people not in there that should be in there? And why are there people in there that shouldn't be in there? Well, you know, there's this thing called politics. Okay. I interviewed Alice Cooper once at the Rock Hall. Right. And one of the questions I always used to ask people is, what is the biggest mistake you think you ever made? And Alice said, oh, that's easy. I had an opportunity to sign with Atlantic or Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I signed with Warner Brothers. Had I signed with Atlantic, I would be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame already. Mm -hmm. Just like Percy Sledge, who had one record, and he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But he's on on Atlantic. Yeah. Huh, interesting. You know, that was on the road again. Everybody yeah. on Atlantic is in the Rock Hall. There's ah. very few artists that are not in the Rock Hall that are on Atlantic. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <clears throat> See, I so, was thinking I mean, that's what it was. I was yeah. thinking it was favoritism. It's the guys that voted them in, or a guy. Well, well personal... of course, there's that. But, yeah. You know, I look back. How is a band like Procol Harum not right. in the Rock Hall? Right. How is Tommy James? who right. sold a hundred million records yeah had as much to do with psychedelic music as the beatles you're right i mean how is he not in the rock hall yeah i i mean there's so many and you know look dolly Parton, she's an amazing talent yeah she didn't even want to be in right I mean, why what is she doing what is miles davis doing in the rock hall right uh, not that he didn't influence a lot of rock and roll people. I mean, Dickie mm-hmm. Betts would tell you yeah. he, a lot of his solos come from stuff that he heard, you know, Miles playing. Right. But I mean, you know, there's the, it, it, you know, Johnny Cash in the Rock Hall. No. M- Eminem. Come on. Eminem. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know. <laughs> the Beastie Boys. I, no. <laughs> I don't get it. I just I don't get it I either. I don't get it. I don't no. get it. And, the, the worst part is, you know, the Cleveland Rock Hall, the actual building. Right. Nobody in that building has anything to do with who gets inducted. That's sad. That's with very With the exception sad. that, you know, a couple of us were voters. But other than that, I mean, that's all done in New York. You know, they, they play their own games and they, you know. You know, me and you could do a better job. Just from our experience. Well, I'm telling you. Know, you. It's too, it's too. What I like about the Country Music Hall of Fame, right. it's very exclusive. Right. There's years that people don't get in. It should be that way. Right. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at it, you know, no Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because they weren't cool. Kiss didn't get in until, you know, 25 years after the Rock Hall was open. Yeah. What's more rock and roll than Kiss? Yeah. 
they're 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 not favorable to a lot of progressive rock artists either. I love no. prog rock. Jethro Tull, come on. Yeah, you know they're not in there. Well, I mean, you know, look if you're going to have Journey, then you need to have Stick right. Scenario. Yep, and Foreigner. Exactly. If you're going to have, um, you know, yes, then you got to, you know, you have to have ELP and you have mm-hmm. to have all those other pioneers exactly. from the same time. Sure, Kansas. And you're, by the way, your friend yeah. John Mayall, mm-hmm. nowhere to be seen in the I know, Hall. I know. If it wasn't for John Mayall, there would be no blues anymore, you know, because well, he's the one who brought no it back. Eric Clapton, there'd be no Jeff Brett, there'd right. be no Jimmy Page. Exactly <laughs> right. You know, you can go earlier, you know, there'd be no Brian Jones. Yeah. You know, no. Yeah. And we all know Zeppelin stole a lot of their music from the old blues guys and didn't give them credit. No, (laughs) ripped it right off. Ripped them right off. You know, who never got it. You know, who never got (laughs) enough credit was the small faces. A lot of people ripped off the small faces. I'm a huge fan of theirs. Yeah. Right. And they made them into the faces. Yeah. became... Rod Stewart, the faces and the small faces. Small faces and faces had nothing no. to do with it. Steve Marriott, man. Yeah. I love Steve Marriott. They, they did so much for rock and roll, and they're not getting recognized for that. It's a shame. I mean, Humble Pie. Humble Pie, yeah. The James Gang. That's right. They'll never go you in. Know? James Gang, they'll never make it. No. You know? Joe no. Walsh, yes, but not the James Gang. Right. It's a shame. It really is. I mean, Joe Walsh is an eagle, you know? Yeah. And that's uh, not where he did his best work. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's a shame. He did his really best is. work as Joe Walsh. Well, another so guy, I just want to mention. Show, Ray? This is like a six hour show. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I go a little long. I've watched you know? two meals go past me already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start wrapping it up here. Um, <laughs> I just want to mention Dickie Betts one more time. Um, sure. I love him to death. One thing you mentioned, one of your biggest regrets was not getting him back in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, um, and he had a, he had some really, he's got some good songs that have never been recorded. Right. Yeah. Um, he wrote a song called, uh, it's that time of life mm-hmm. that I thought was just a masterpiece. And it was about having to, uh, lose so many people, but still keeping your head up, you know? Yeah. Really a good positive message. Great guitar work on it. Yep. Um, the closest we got, we were doing a DVD for Eagle Rock. And I said, hey, you know, we need a new song for this. And uh, right. we were sitting in the bar before doing the show. And Dickie asked for a pen and a paper. And I got mm-hmm. it for him. He starts writing down a song called The Cleveland Blues, which uh, was is on that DVD. And that's the closest we got. But, mm. man, I would have loved to have just uh, gotten a great record out of him. And we've been together for over 20 years. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but I emailed you a couple of times trying to get an interview with Dickie, and he was on the way out, I guess. He was ready for retirement and, you know, wasn't doing much, that kind of Well, thing. he had he had, had a stroke that we didn't tell anybody about. Oh, I didn't know that. Didn't yeah, know that. and then he had a massive stroke, which is why he can't do anything anymore. I did anymore. not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Dickie studied Miles Davis, which makes a lot of sense because – Everybody classifies the Allman Brothers as a Southern rock band, but they, they did a lot of jazz and infusion. Yes, absolutely. And they Much were an incredible more, yeah. band, you know? They really were. Yeah. No, they and, and you know, Miles and the brothers jammed a lot at the Fillmore together. So, you know, they, they did have a relationship. Hey, you know, now that I think of it, Miles probably does belong in the Rock and Roll Hall. I, I think so. Because he, I go he added a that. lot. But um, I'm not sure that uh, Percy Sledge... Uh, fit the bill yeah, yeah i still a... haven't been able to figure out that second song you know for percy sledge it... <laughs> yeah huh. i mean it shouldn't be for one hit wonders if you know if percy sledge is in then every mother's son should be in that's right. my new thing now <clears throat> i want every mother's son to be in the rock and roll hall of fame do you remember mm-hmm. them yes i Come do on, remember what, what was the song <sighs> Come on down to my oh, boat, baby. baby. Come da, da, da. on down. Yeah, so we can that's right. Play. That's right. I remember that. That's as good a song as a man loves a woman. Yeah, Got it is. Yeah. You know, I talk to from time to time, 
guy you would love, uh, Arthur Brown. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I've had I him on the show him many times. I saw him live once. I, was so, I saw him at uh, Albert Hall in 1968. Yeah. Um, he actually was on the show that Hendrix was on. And yeah. he was yeah. amazing, out of his cool. mind. He's a pioneer, you know? Yeah. First guy to paint his face and do all that right. stuff. Yeah, had we fire on his David head. Bowie without him. <laughs> yeah. I am the god of hellfire. Hellfire. He did a promo for me saying that, which was really no cool. Kidding. Yeah. Did he ever have a second record or no? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got he's got a lot of music out. He's got some new stuff out there too. But not hits. He didn't have another hit. No, he? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. We should you know uh, what we should do. You and me, Ray, let's mm-hmm. get the one hit wonders hall of fame together that would be incredible that because would be because they're all fantastic. great songs yeah i and i've had a lot of guys on this show you know and i i can still contact them i mean we can do a show you know if you wow. want they, they would definitely that would be do really it. cool to do a one hit wonders show yeah i know the guy that sang uh, green tambourine the lemon pipers oh sure yeah you know do you know what their sing- their second single was called? I I remember, but I'm not, it's not coming to me. Go ahead. Rice is nice, yes. but incest is best. That's right. 100% Didn't get a lot right. of radio play. They actually, yeah. you know, they debuted Green Tambourine on uh, Upbeat. They were from Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, that's right. Jamie Jamie Lyons. Yep. Oh no, Jamie Lyons was the music explosion. Mm-hmm. There was I a love whole all those bands. The, yeah, they were all. The, there was the same band played behind all 1910 fruit gum company, yep. Ohio express, um, Jerry cats and Jerry Cassinets were the guys Cassinets cats. Mm-hmm. They produced all those records made millions and millions. And those bands made <clears throat> dimes and dimes. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is talking to Tommy James. Yeah, I love you know, Tommy. By the way, book. the best rock and roll book ever written. Yes. The Mob. The, the Mob. And the, the best. Music. Yeah. Uh-huh. The best. I read it in one day. Yeah. I, I got up. I started reading it. Next thing I knew, it was like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And I called Tommy. I said, I just finished your book. He says, I just gave it to you last night. I said, I know. It's a great I book. I got to tell you, it was like <clears throat> sitting on the couch talking to you. Yeah. It was like you were just telling me the story. The book was just, it flew mm-hmm. by. You know, Tommy and also Todd Rundgren, they've got some great ideas about doing yeah. things in this era and bringing back, you know, the music and all that. I mean, we should all get together and have a powwow, you know? I would do that. I would do I that would too. Do that. Anytime yeah. you want, I'll fly to Cleveland. I don't care. You know, there you go. We can open up a one hit wonder hall of fame right next to the rock hall. Can, we'll take over help. the science center. I can help you line up all, a lot of a lot of artists that I've interviewed. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me. I just think that would be cool. That would be cool. So, all the you know, these guys are maybe all we forgotten. could go as far as two hit wonders so we can get the Bull Brummels in there. <laughs> the Bull Brummels. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who produced those Bull Brummel singles? Yes. Um. Oh my God! Oh, Sly Stone. Sly Stone. There you go. <laughs> laugh, laugh, and just a little. Produced by Sly Stone. That's right. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Dave, here's your final question. Okay. Okay. I know we're getting long here, but that—that's what I do. <laughs> uh, you know, Al Cooper's got a radio show, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. I, I, I have every ver- I have every edition of it. New music for old people. Let's give yep. Al a nice little plug here while we're at it. Here's a question. And and I'm also a lot, Jesse, I'm mentioning all these names. Jesse Colin Young. I, I know Jesse. Uh, we did an interview when he had the Lyme disease, which was horrible. Yeah. Yep. Um, he still does, but it's in control. Yeah. Yeah. He's a nice guy. He's a really cool guy. Too. Oh, wonderful guy. They're all great guys. All right. This question I ask everybody, I get some very interesting answers. If you had a Field of the Dreams wish like the movie to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? And I know you've met a lot of people, so this is going to be a hard one for you. Ugh. 
So somebody I haven't worked with or somebody that I have? No, been? you could have worked with them. It's just somebody. You'd... I mean, the, I, I would go into the studio again with Paul McCartney in a heartbeat. Okay. With I Paul. mean, that was just, I learned so much in like really? five hours. Really? And I've been in huh. studios for a hundred years. I, I learned more in that day from him. Interesting. Just how to do things, how to make this sound like this or make this or, and just, you know, uh, when I watched Get Back, mm -hmm. and I'd been fortunate to be in the studio with Ringo as well, um, watching them work, it was the exact same way. I mean, nothing changed. Mm -hmm. They still had that same ethic of, you know, we're going to get it. Yeah. You know, we just have to be patient. Yeah. Um, what would you think of Get Back? Good. Very just good. Just good? That's it? But well, I've seen a lot of Beatles stuff, you know? Yeah. But that was <laughs> That's like the problem. Teeth, and I got to tell you. I've seen a lot I, of Beatles stuff. I couldn't breathe watching it. Really? I couldn't breathe watching it. Yeah, it was so exciting for me. Yeah. Watching those songs come together. And then uh, and then I went to see the um, IMAX version. Okay. Uh, it's It was just the part with the uh, rooftop concert. And yep. the host was... Um, What's his name? The guy that directed it. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I forgot. It's what happens when you get older. Oh, my God. How am I not? <laughs> I, can, I can see his face. He, and he took questions from the audience and everything. It was really yeah. cool. I, uh, Peter, Peter um, Jackson. That's it. Peter Jackson, right? And he said, that there's another there's like another five or six hours that he could put together of songs that they didn't even touch on that we saw. Wow. Incredible. Because it's a pretty much all of Abbey Road was done during was at least being worked on during that time. Yeah. A bunch of stuff from All Things Must Pass. Mm -hmm. We saw stuff from Joe John's solo albums, Paul's solo, even Backstreet of my backseat of my car, which didn't come out till Ram. Um it was just exciting to see those things in their infancy, you know. All things must pass. I like that movie, George Harrison. That was a. Uh, I love that because it's very spiritual, uh, you know. George was amazing. He was the real deal. He was the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. Not afraid to die. That's for sure. He thought. No, he wasn't, and yeah. certainly not afraid to live. Yeah. That was the I, opposite of Harry Nelson. Yeah. When I was working with Harry. Um, what a great artist, Harry Nielsen. Oh, you know? yeah, that was, I guess, Please. you know what? If there's anybody else past or present, I would I would like to spend another day with Harry. He had so much more to offer, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And Gosh. we had done a record uh, with Mark uh, Hudson right. right before he died that finally just came out over the last couple of years. Hmm. Um, and it was, it was, it was weird. It was the first record he had made after Pussycat, mm -hmm. which is when him and Lennon went in together and, and Harry tore his throat up because John wanted him to scream and everything. Yeah. And he never got that voice back. And it was being in the studio with him while he was trying to get this stuff done was um, mm. kind of heartbreaking. Right. But um, Harry had had a minor heart attack. And we'd gone to, I took him to his doctor out in LA and the doctor was very succinct. He told mm -hmm. him, you need to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. You need to stop smoking. You can't eat a piece of cake before dinner and have the rest of the cake after dinner. You can't take these pills that you're taking. You need to lose weight. Uh, or I'm telling you, you've got like three months to three years to live. Mm. And we went back to his house and, uh, and his wife said, so what did the doctor say? And Harry says, I got three months. And I said, that's not what he said at all. Yeah. I said, that's exactly what he said. <clears throat> I'm not going to stop living just so I don't die. Mm -hmm. Three months yeah. later, he was gone. Yeah. Uh, did, did he take the doctor's orders? Did he try to? No, he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. He took the doctor's orders. He says, I'm not going to stop right. living just so I don't die. Yeah. Huh. I've seen a lot of that. I, I, I met Wolfman Jack. 
What he's a sitting there. Man. He's oh. sitting there eating a big bowl of French fries with tons of salt, smoking one after another. I think they were camels. You know, I mean, and he, he was, was overweight. Yeah, he was a camel smoker. Yeah, he was overweight. I had so many fun nights at his house down there in Florida. He used that, to have that um, that nightclub. Um, I think it was in Orlando. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He did a show in Orlando. Yeah, he did a show in Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and Joe and I used to go down and hang out with him. He was um, he's cool, interesting guy. guy. He thanked me in his book. I was I was very excited about that. I got to thank you in his book. Yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, He he passed away. I don't even think the book was out. Right when he when he died. No, it was out. Yeah, I remember talking to him. Well. I had a manuscript of it. I don't know whether I had the actual book. I don't know that huh. I've ever seen the actual book. Right. I've got the book. Um, I bought it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to mention, I, I went to a seminar with George Martin. It was at uh, the Birchmere in D.C. in Virginia. Yep. And it was very rare. You never, you don't see George Martin in seminars. But he was talking about Sgt. Peppers and the Beatles. And he had movies. It was so cool. You know? yeah, I did a two and a half hour interview with him at the Rock Hall. Really? And and I've done like you a million interviews. You yeah. Know? Yep. And it's the only time I was ever a wreck. Yep. Because I thought <laughs> I have an opportunity to look so stupid in front of this guy. And uh, and afterwards, he told me I actually asked him a few questions that people had never asked him before. Mm-hmm. So I felt pretty good about that. That's important. I say I do my research. Yeah. You know, when I ask my uh, my rock hero and the guy I always got nervous about interviewing is Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull because he's very intelligent. Mm-hmm. And I've I just had him on the show not long ago, but I always make sure I ask him something that nobody else will right. ask him. Right. And we've even talked about politics and religion. I he likes to talk about religion. That's that's one of his pet peeves. Mm-hmm. But I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean when you. Yeah, we were we were in the elevator going from like the first floor up to the third floor where the theater was, where we yeah. did the interview. Right. And we the doors open and as the elevator doors open on the wall right across from us was the John and Yoko naked picture mm-hmm. from Two Virgins. Mm-hmm. And George looks at that and his <laughs> wife is in the elevator, too. And he says, I remember the day John brought us this and we all said the exact same thing. Who wants to see either of you? <laughs> and I just started laughing, and we were ten steps away from the theater at that point, and it just lightened the whole thing for me. I mean, it just made yeah. it. You know, he he had that way of him. He was what a yeah. what a an amazing human he was. And if you're Jewish, you say Ay vey. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my dad my dad was Jewish. Yeah, uh, mine too. I had to, I had the best of both worlds. My mom was Catholic. My dad Jewish. Uh, <laughs> nice mixture, huh? <laughs> yeah, I had the whole thing going for me. You know, I was yeah, <laughs> yeah. I could have been bought bar mitzvah, but I I didn't do it. I, I could have made a lot of money. I don't know why you didn't do it. Well, yeah, and you, you know, know, Ben Orr might have played there for you. Exactly. <laughs> you know? David, what's next? What's next for David Spiro? What's going on? Well, um, next week we'll tell a lot, to tell you okay. the truth. Okay, all right. Um, hopefully I'll have some good uh, Cat Stevens news to tell everybody. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. But, um, in the meantime, Cat Stevens. yeah, A yep. Life in the Wings is the book. Yes. You can get it. It's at Amazon. It's at uh, Barnes & Noble. Or yep. you can go to the A Life in the Wings website, which is a dash life dash in dash the dash wings dot square dot site fantastic and you i'm gonna put that on the screen probably yes i'm gonna post those links um i've got basically five or six different websites that this will be on and oh I, cool i streamline everywhere pandora itunes you name it. I'm ever Spotify. I'm everywhere. So everybody will that's how definitely you get hear your this. Six million listeners. You know? That's that's why I exactly. And that's why I make the big bucks, right? There you go, <laughs> David. It's been uh, an absolute 
pleasure, man, because you, it's, Ray. it's 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 so good to talk to somebody that's so intelligent about music and rock and roll like you are. Well, let man. me know when you find that person. I'd love to have a conversation <laughs> with you. <them>. Please keep <laughs> in touch. I love your idea about one hit wonders. You know, if I can help in any way, let's do it. Like I said, I'll fly to Cleveland, you know. There you go. I mean, Tom Hanks would probably jump on that. He probably would. Yes. I think he'd get a kick out of that. Yeah, we'll put our minds together in our contacts and we can come up with something big, I know, for sure. And then he can do that movie called That Thing You Did. Yes, yeah, That Thing You Did. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, I love Ray. It. It's been great talking to you. My best to your wife. Hope she's feeling better and let her get some rest. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. All right, Bye-bye. man. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Bye.